I'm Leah Lane, an award-winning travel writer and author of Places I Remember, Tales, Truths, Delights from 100 Countries. On this podcast, we share conversations with travelers about fascinating destinations and memorable experiences around the world. Randall Lane is the editor and chief content officer of Forbes. He's also my son. So I know he's had many adventures and has met many fascinating people. And today he's going to share with us just a few of them. Welcome, Rand. Hi, Mom. Hi. I'm glad to be on your podcast. Great. I'm so glad that you're on my podcast. You are one interesting man. So I just want to go over your places and people and things you've done that are the most interesting. I know you've traveled a lot for business and, and pleasure, and you're something of a I'm risk so taker. I'm so trying to catch up with you. <laughs> well, you will. And I certainly haven't had the adventures you have. So let's just start with some of them. Let's 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 just start with one you want to tell us that's interesting and different. And uh, here we go, folks. Okay, well, uh, you know, travel, you know, you taught me from a young age that, I mean, life is to be experienced and to get out there and, and live it. And so I have, I have tried to live that credo. I, I generally, uh, since college, have lived the idea that, you know, better, better to regret the things you did than the things you did not. So you take, you know, when you're traveling, you take chances. You don't ask what if. I probably, the, the, I learned that when I was in, Right out of um, right out of college, a bunch of us went to Mardi Gras, and we drove we drove down from New York. We stopped in Memphis, and we were at Graceland, and it was too expensive to go. It was like twenty bucks a mission, and we were poor, and we were like, "Oh, forget it, we're not going to go." And then for the re- for ye- for the rest of like for decades, we're like, "Why?" We were in Memphis, and we didn't go to Graceland for twenty bucks. Like, <laughs> I do think that they. So I tried to never make that mistake and, and generally playing at higher stakes, but well, I, uh, I think you can get back there. <laughs> I have, I have since rectified that and it's worth, it's worth 20, not that much more, but you got to check it off when you're in Memphis. I agree. I, Memphis. Think, I think disappointments are, are, are the things that bother you the most. I wish I had bought that strange thing that now is worth a lot of money and you know, the, the, the regrets, but yeah, uh, the regrets are what you don't do. So, you know, I tried yeah, not a hundred countries plus like you, but probably, uh, I'm getting up at 60 or 70 and, you know, a lot of them are weird. I travel for work a lot. I mean, one, one story I was telling recently was how I was in Liberia, which is a place that not many people get to go to or they don't want to go to. It's one of the 10 poorest countries in the world. And I was there for a, we were bringing a bunch of philanthropists and I was leading a trip of, of American philanthropists to try to help Liberia, which has an American, you know, the big history of American Liberia. And I do think there's a moral, there's a lot of reasons why successful Americans should have, feel an obligation and also use it as a laboratory to try to come with solutions for the world. So we were going to try to bring, the idea was that we were going to help accelerate rural health care. And a lot of people in the world don't have any access to health care at all. And we were trying to see, find models that could bring health care that last mile to the people who literally, if you're living in the jungle of Liberia and you break your leg, it could be a death sentence because you're going to get gangrene and you can't get to the hospital, it's not going to set right. Certainly giving birth is a harrowing and life-threatening experience. Just, you know, just giving people prenatal vitamins and prenatal care, basic things, you could save a lot of lives with the most simple things. And so we were we were going to go to a village that had never seen Westerners before. It was literally deep in the Liberian rainforest and we rented helicopters and we we're going to land on their soccer field and the problem was, first of all, flying a Liberian helicopter, it's not like getting the, the Miami uh, Biscayne Bay tour or the no. Las Vegas Strip tour <laughs> helicopters. These were some rusty helicopters with some folks speaking you know, languages of places that didn't strike me as, you know, there were Eastern European veteran helicopters flying. It was, you know, it was the kind of thing, but again, it's the best Liberia had. We got up in the helicopters and... There's no map because literally there are no roads. You're flying over true virgin rainforest to find people who still live very primitive lives and die. You know, the average life life expectancy where we were going wasn't much more than 30 years old. 
it was very, you know, it's very easy to die when you're a child and it's very hard to live past 50. I mean, because any problem you have is a death sentence. So we're trying to, you know, and it's just so dense. And there's, again, there's no even, there's no electricity in most of Liberia. So there's no wires, there's no roads. It's just jungle. So we were flying around in two different helicopters and we're, 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 we can't wait to reach this village and have this really interesting experience. And we were circling and we're trying to find out what's going on because the pilots don't speak English. And it turns out by kind of Panama that they can't find the village. The GPS coordinates are off. They're looking, they're just looking at the rainforest and they cannot find it. So needle in a haystack. We start to run low on gas because the problem when you go into the jungle is you basically better start turning around when you're at half. You better be a drop over half or you're going to have a bad ending here because it's not like there are landing ships anywhere. And so we were getting, we weren't that close to that, but we're getting to where we were going to have to d- just immediately turn back or, or bail on this mission. And so they saw a soccer field and we start going down and we're like, and we see people running out of the, the little schools and things like that. And it turns out they were just making a beeline to land somewhere while they figured out where we were. This was the wrong village. And so we land in a, and in some ways this was a more incredible experience than the village we were supposed to go to because these people had no, they had, you know, they, this one is not quite as, as r- remote and as, as kind of deprived of, you know, they had, they looked at, you know, they had running water, they had a schoolhouse, but you know, they do not get vil- visitors swooping down in helicopters very often. And they weren't expecting where in the other village, they've been prepared that these people are coming. And we had all the stuff and clothes and all sorts of, you know, we brought, you know, basically an entire, you know, missions worth of stuff to help them. And all of a sudden we just drop into this field and the kids are running out of school. Like, like, I mean, they could not believe it. And while they were figuring it out, it was very moving because they were fascinated by, uh, we, we had a lot of, we had video cameras and things like that. And we were taking pictures of them. They'd never seen themselves. I have still a picture of myself because they never had a picture of themselves. And I don't know, you know, I was in their houses. I don't even know if they have mirrors. So all oh the kids, goodness. we started taking pictures of them and they weren't, inter- they didn't really know how to pose, but they were, were, they were incredulous that then I would show it to them and they would look like they were looking into infinity because they never seen themselves, certainly wow. not past the mirror. And I don't even know if they had mirrors, but the way they were looking at these phones, they were just absolutely captivated. And it was a very... It reminded you of how, you know, how far society has come. We eventually did make it to the village. Barely was enough gas. We had to make a pit stop. We couldn't even make it to Monrovia. We had to pit stop at another city on the way back. But it's that cultural, it's that cultural connection. That's part of what makes travel great. You're the one, Mom, who taught me how when you travel, you're supposed to bring, you should bring a Polaroid camera when you're, and this, this predates cell phones, but when you're going to very, very poor places, they don't necessarily have pictures of themselves. Right. It's still uh, today. I, I've been in some African villages where it wasn't quite as remote, but they still were so delighted to see their picture, even even a couple of years ago. Wow. Well, I'm glad I, I, I didn't like going to places. I like going to places nobody's been. Yeah. I, I pride myself on going to countries that are even for vacation with my, you know, my buddies for many years, we would try to go, we would try to check off like the most dangerous places in the world or the most hard to get to. We got to, we didn't get to Iran. We didn't get to North Korea, but we got to most of them other than that. Um, what about the the Syria border story? Oh yeah, that's a, that's a fun story. We we did a trip to Lebanon and Syria, and this is, this is more than 20 years ago, about 20 years ago. So it's before the tragedy. And it, to spend time in Syria is to really feel a profound sadness about what's going on there because these are beautiful nice people like you find everywhere in the world and they have this devastation rained on them by this tyrant but anyway we we were we were in lebanon which i've been to several times this is a wonderful country a beautiful country and a fun country uh but that was our first time there and we found it very interesting and then we wanted to go to syria so we were crossing over the land border from Lebanon to Syria, and that's not a, the kind of border even then before, you know, the war, it was still a hot area. We went through, um, when we were in Syria, a lot of our travel, we had to go through Hezbollah checkpoints, and we would show our passports to Hezbollah militiamen. So it was still a dicey place, but it wasn't what it is now. But they do not see Americans coming overland from Lebanon to Syria, pretty, from what I could tell, pretty much ever. 
And we've been warned that since I'm a journalist and my two friends were journalists, again, we weren't there to write a story. We were there just to just literally travel. But we were warned that do not tell anybody there you're journalists because just don't. And so we check in at Passport Control and my friend John, they said, what are you? And he goes, barber. He wanted to, and he kind of, they didn't know what that meant in English. So he kind of did a scissors thing with his fingers and they're like, oh yeah, coiffure, whatever it is. They stamp his passport and he goes, the next guy, they go, what are you? Is my friend Tom, who was feeling a little more like righteous. And he's like, I'm a journalist. And they go, oh, a journalist. And they stamp his passport and they go, journalist. And they stamp his passport and his passport then gets a stamp on it. And they look at me, what do you do? And I, now I'm kind of feeling like one told the truth and one told a fib. And I, now I don't even, I don't feel comfortable with either now because now I'm the third guy and am I the other journalist? Am I the other barber? So I wound up, so I decided, I said, I'm going to get creative. I said, I'm going to say I'm an editor because I don't figure they won't, that'll be kind of like, it's, it doesn't say journalist, but it doesn't say barber. I, I didn't know how I was going to pretend I'm a barber. I don't even have any hair. I don't know how they pretend I'm a barber. But I go, editor, they go, editor, they go, journalist. And they stamp my passport. And we both had a stamp on our passport that said, we cannot leave Syria until we go to the Ministry of Information. And we wound up having getting stuck in Syria. John can leave whenever he wanted, but we wound up having to stay a couple extra days because we were supposed to leave on a weekend. We had to stay through a Monday to go to the Ministry of Information to then basically get interrogated. Nicely, I, I don't want to exaggerate that somehow we were tortured, but we were definitely quizzed about what we had to do there. Wouldn't we want to write a nice story? And basically until they signed us out, we were stuck in uh, Assad's Syria did your you know, friend have to cut hair, the one who said he was a barber? He just laughed at us the whole time. And there's probably a lesson. I don't know. One, one lesson would be don't lie to Border Patrol agents. But the other lesson is maybe don't tell the truth to Border Patrol agents. It's hard to know. Like, it depends yeah. on where you are. Yeah, I guess so. That's, you got to call an audible on that one. Yeah, a call an audible. Well, so far, so good. We have some interest. I don't know all these details. I'm learning some of this myself. And I'm glad I didn't know some of it. What about, I do know about when you uh, were in Vietnam. and uh, Yeah, I got a Vietnam story. But it's not as good as, you know, you know, real a lot of Vietnam stories. But, uh, you know, I was there when it was just opening up. And again, it's a beautiful country. And they actually, because of the connection to America, you would think, and I've been back also, you would think there's a, um, there's a bitterness, but actually there's not. They, they, they really like Americans there. They, they, the past is the past and they, there is a shared history and there is a, a desire to move on. Yes, that's very notable. I, I found that too. And also in Cambodia, there's a certain Buddhist uh, way of life, looking at it, very forgiving and moving forward. It's very touching. I found, I found Cambodia in some ways much sadder. I found that that history, and there was something about Vietnam had this ebullient kind of vibe where Cambodia to me felt a little, um, the, the tragedy had not, had not lifted, where Vietnam also had a tragedy, but because they did, they, because, you know, ultimately they forged their own destiny. I, I felt you know, I listen, they're both incredible places. Anybody that yes. can get to, yeah. to get to, to um, Angkor Wat should. And Phnom Penh's also a super interesting place. But in Vietnam, I was in ha Long Bay with my future wife. That's a beautiful... Uh, yeah, Mom, have you been there? Yes, I have. It is exquisite. It's the limestone peaks coming out of the blue-green yeah, water. And fishing rocks villages. coming out of the water. So, yeah. and, it's a big, it's more than a bay. It's like a giant mini sea with giant rocks. It's kind of, so it's a beautiful place. We we're on an overnight boat trip. It was not a fancy. It was like a big four story. It was like a, almost like the Staten Island ferry and you could sleep over on it. And there were like 20 people. And it was kind of like a backpacker kind of trip trying to, you know, trying to watch some money because, you know, we we're on a budget. And the last day we went swimming and a bunch of us, climbed to the top of the boat and jumped off and even in looking at a couple of people jumped before me and even in looking i was like this is really high and it had to be you know, you know cuz you're you're a, it's a you know you're at the top of the captain's thing which is on top of a three story boat it had to be a good 40 50 feet above the water and like you know i've jumped off high things before but this you know you also the way math works every 5 or 10 feet you're like exponentially going fast this looked a little higher and oh, I was goodness. comfortable, but everybody else had already jumped. And so I'm like, ah, and I was like, do it, do it. And I jump and I hit the water. I hit the water with my arms out and I just felt a rip. 
and I dislocated my shoulder before I'd had it surgically repaired and I felt my shoulder rip out and I, I knew what it was because I'd had it ha happen before. And, I, and the impact of the water ripped my shoulder out of my arm out of my shoulder socket. And, you know, those who, who anybody who's ever had a dislocated shoulder understands that, you know, I used to think that I could, that if I was a guy captured in a war, I'd never tell uh, I could withstand pain and pain doesn't bother me that much. But after that, I'm, after you just look at your shoulder, I'm like, what do you want to know? Like, oh it's, a, it's a very painful thing. And luckily, I did know, I knew kind of what was going to happen, which was, you know, someone's going to have to stick it back in. But it's really, really painful because your you're kind of ball, your socket is rubbing up against the ball and it, it feels very, very, very off. We get and the it, point. Yeah. It's pain. Anyway, we go in. The problem is Helen Bay, northern, northern Vietnam. I mean, you're a couple hours from Hanoi, and Hanoi is not even where you would want to have something like this happen. And you're in a rural, so they wound up taking me to an army hospital that was outside. It was an old North Vietnamese army hospital. That it was, it was one little doctor and a couple nurses. And the they they first they take me for an X-ray, and there was no little lead pad. And I told Jen, I said, look, I said, get out of this room because this is like a radiation city here. And they gave me a x-ray and my my hair literally stood up on end wow. and I, I, in retrospect i thought i had to be imagining that but i've actually read up on it and that actually can happen uh, i mean and i guess that's where the kind of the cartoonish aspect of that happens you know but i felt my hair stand up on end they take the you know they said it's dislocated yeah I, I knew that but you know i wanted them to see it before they go start messing with me and they could not and i'm literally on a, on a straw mat outside in the sun and the, you know it's barely covered it's like uh they cannot get they're trying to push my arm in and they cannot uh, you know i'm uh, you know whatever six feet tall and 200 pounds and and the, the doctor just does not have the leverage he's a small little you know older guy and he could not get it in and so finally he sat down next he sat across from me and lied down across from me and put his heel into my shoulder and tried to torque it in and i remembered from the first time I dislocated that before I was in a good hospital in Philadelphia. And I remember them telling me before they did this maneuver. So I knew they were doing the right thing. If I didn't, if, I don't know about this, this heel thing. I'd never seen that, but I knew they're supposed to push it in. And I also remember that they told me at the time, there's a five or 10% chance your arm's going to shatter, in which case we go to surgery right away. And so I knew in the back of my head, I remembered that generally you snap it back in to be okay, but there is a five, two, 10, whatever percent chance that there's gonna be something bad happen. And when he was digging his heel into me, like standing you know, 180 degrees lying down directly opposite from me, I was like, you know what? I, I told you, I said, you gotta get me out of here because if my arm shatters and I'm, I think it was, I think it was two, four, it was a couple hours from Hanoi. And even Hanoi is not a place you wanna be in. That's where something really bad could happen. So I said, we're just gonna have to go even though I'm in tremendous pain. And so they put me in the back of this minibus for the tour and every, and we're on unpaved roads the whole oh, way back to the north. And I'm sitting there screaming bloody murder the whole time. And the, I, I felt bad because the whole bus was looking like, like this was a terrible experience for them too. And I was trying to bite the bullet here literally, but uh, it's really hard. And it was so painful. I passed out and something amazing happened was I passed out and my, my body contorted my shoulder back in on its own. I just oh relaxed, my gosh. I guess. And it wow. instinctively, I guess, it, whatever it is, and I got to know, like, my arm is back in. And they x rayed me at a, at a decent hospital in Hanoi. And they're like, yeah, your arm is back in, but you should check it out. But when you get back to New York and we're about to leave, I'm like, yeah, I'll do that. I hope but, you, you know, had a better rest of the trip. Yeah, luckily that was at the end. So yeah. uh, that was the, the grand finale. Yeah, there's a. Uh, you know, you take that was probably a needless risk because the yes. moment of jumping off the top <laughs> yes. of a boat, you could do that anywhere. That was probably, again, no, I think you have to choose good. your risk. That was probably yeah. a, a, a ill chosen. How about how about when you like to race cars? I know. Yeah, well, that's you know, that's actually safer. If you know what you're doing, that's not very dangerous. And I've you know, I've done a bit of that. And uh, you know, the most fun trip I took, I did something. I was in the, something called the Silver State Classic, which is a race. In rural Nevada, Nevada being the, the Wild West, literally still of America, where everything is legal. And they so the race organizers for 10 years had talked the state into letting them have a two-lane desert highway, one, one, one lane in each direction, so two lanes total, and letting people bring cars and drive as fast 
as they can or want to or dare for, I think it's 50 miles, 50 or 100 miles. And it's a race. And the winners, I mean, the if you're at the Daytona 500 or something, or the Indy 500, the, the average speed of the winner is about 150 miles an hour. And in this race, to win, you got to get to about 220 miles an hour on an on a oh. open public <laughs> road. Now, two people had died in the first 10 years. So they, they, instead of just letting not everybody race and try to go 200 miles an hour, realizing that that was going to be crazy, they start putting people into, they make it a math, a math test where you have to try to estimate your time and come as close as you can to your time. So I, we entered, I didn't have a car. And so my friend Eric and I flew out to Nevada and I just went to a rental car agency and I just rented a car. And took it to this race, and I rented I, I rented a Corvette convertible. I'm like, okay, well, I'm just gonna have a good time in Vegas, and drove it out to this race. And those guys, they didn't care at the race, or you know, they didn't care if it was in a rent a car. They have a giant parade through town. They're about hundred cars, two hundred cars doing this. Some amazing cars, fast cars, and it was in Ely, Nevada, which is up near the Utah border. I mean, we're you're in it's right it's you're right parallel to Area 51. You're basically racing down Area 51. There's nobody there. It's you and the wool in the Jackals, yeah, but Ely's this little truck town uh, on one of the inter- off one of the interstates, or maybe it's even a, it's actually right off of uh, Route sixty six, the old Route sixty six actually, and they, there's a brothel in town, a legal brothel, and so they have something called the Hooker's Choice Awards, where the hookers were the <laughs> judges of the, the best coolest cars, and then the next day, so you're not in you know you're not in Kansas anymore, and then the next day we raced. I saw cars on the fire on the side of the road. And we, but by the way, we raced with the top down. Oh, it was a convertible. Right. We raced with the top down because at the speed, we, we, entered in the, we entered in the 110 mile an hour category, which is the most popular category. It's the most popular category because it's the fastest category they'll let you race without like getting roll bars or fire extinguishers that, that you can race a street legal car. To go 200 miles an hour, they want this thing to have like, fire extinct you know anti-fire which is smart you know roll bars they want it to be like a real race car but if you just want to ring a regular car you could drive it not as fast as 110 you got to average 110 so you you, you know you're going to go 100 you know, try to get it up to 125 130 135 try to make up for the slow start and you know you got turns and stuff like that it's not just a straight you got to, you're driving through canyons so we race with the top down and uh, I, I brought my friend Eric, who's uh, he's actually an astrophysicist at Los Alamos, who had all the. So I had the best. I had the best math guy, and we had about thirty people in our division. We came in second and got a trophy. It's still one of the proudest things I own. The guy who came in first actually had measured the course before, and he was flying without a navigator and told himself at the exact speed he should be, and it was talking to himself for the entire race. So he pre-recorded the race. I didn't say so he was within, we, we got to, I still remember we were 0.8 seconds. We were less than a second off, which is pretty good. I think it was 90 miles actually. So we got to 90, we did 90 miles in a little less than an hour, about 40 ish minutes. We were off 0.8 seconds, less than a second, but we did not win. The guy who talked to himself was 0.2 seconds, which is pretty, pretty. It still amazing. bothers you. I can see. Pretty amazing. He's I'm glad of... I didn't know about this story in detail. Let me tell you, I think, I think I get the point. You, you enjoy excitement. Rand's travel adventures are pretty incredible and he has lots more. So I'm going to put out another episode of his travel tales next week, including famous people he's met around the world and Hemingway related adventures in Cuba and Pamplona, Spain. So thank you, Randall Lane, and thank you, travel lovers. Thanks for listening to our award-winning podcast. We've recorded over 100 episodes of Places I Remember, so follow us on any podcast app. And new monthly episodes are also on YouTube with gorgeous video. My book, Places I Remember, is available in print and Kindle, and I read the audio version. Follow my travel writing at Forbes.com. Contact me at the links in the show notes or on my website, places I remember, and keep making your own travel memories. <laughs>